Hi, my name is Ruby Marie and I am a survivor of forced marriage and honour-based abuse. I grew up in Wales. We kept ourselves to ourselves because there was so much racism going on in our neighbourhood and town. We wasn't allowed to talk to anybody who wasn't our own race. The reason for that was so we wouldn't get influenced by Westerners. It's, it's very odd because if you do something as a family, it affects everybody else in your community, especially with women. Um, if a woman has done something, and it could be the simple thing of just falling in love with somebody, it's seen as you've penetrated the reputation of the whole community. And that's where things can go wrong into a lead up to a forced marriage. I've got an elder sister who was close to 18 years old and I was around about, I was 15 and she had a secret boyfriend. So my sister was in love with somebody and she wanted to get married to him. He was the same race, same culture, same religion, everything. And my father said, no. The reason we being that he said no is because he wanted his daughters to get married to outside of the community. He beat my sister very, very badly. And my sister ran away from a home two weeks after that. After my sister ran away from home, they knew that all eyes would be turned on me. Um, they all started to keep their children, my cousins, their children, my cousins, away from me because they thought I was bad influence because I had a secret boyfriend and my sister ran away and she brought shame to the family. It was getting quite bad because even if we went to the, the corner shop, we would get spat at. My mom said, oh, you know, everyone's thought it would be good for us as a family to go to Bangladesh. When the transport came in front of the house, I remember a lot of people were shaking hands with my dad and I thought, hang on, this is a bit weird. We left in April and didn't come back in September. And then he goes, oh, um, wouldn't it be great if we got Ruby married? I was like, what? And then it all made sense. They were keeping me sweet to get married 15 year old still 15 at this time i started kicking off i was like no i'm not having this depression kicked in very quickly i think i was already depressed at that time anyway being so isolated away from everyone from home best way i can describe the atmosphere where we lived in the mansion was like princess jasmine from aladdin i was a british asian girl living in a third world country and I can't do nothing. The only person I got can talk to is this uncle of mine. So I went and started speaking to him. And he said, well, if you keep saying no, you will be locked up in the village in the middle of nowhere, probably beaten and beaten and beaten till you can't talk anymore. You probably not get fed. You probably tied up, but I knew I had to see go with it i knew that was my only path out of that country i saw this person that i was gonna get married to and he looked pretty young not to my knowledge he was 30 years old i was 15. engagement date was set you're tormented because you love your family you absolutely love your family and then they are the ones that's putting you through this hell and you're like what have i done wrong after that he raped me every single day, every single day. They own you if you're his wife now, you know, that's what the world was, you know, saying to me, you're his wife now, whatever he wants, he gets. One thing that my uncle did before I got married, he secretly actually gave me the pill. Now the contraception pill. And I really appreciated him for that. But then it came to a point where there was a lot of whispering going around, Chinese whispers of like, oh, you know, oh, it'd be so good to if we hit, we could hear little patter, patter feet on the running around on the floors. And his sister comes and sits next to me and threw the pills at me first, then sat next to me. And she goes, this is why she's not getting pregnant. And I put my head down. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? A week after, she took the pills away. I actually bled for one day. And I was like, oh, 
okay, I'm on my period. You know, it's coming. And then it stopped. And then a week after that, there was no, there, there, there was like still nothing. So I only bled for the one day and I thought, oh my God, what's going on? And then I said to, I said to him, I think I need to go to the doctors because I wanted to know what was happening with my body. I found out that I was pregnant. My father was very, very happy. The so-called husband was extremely happy because now he's going to have a child who's going to be British. I started to vomit and vomit and vomit throughout the whole day. And this went on for two weeks and I lost two stones. I was got to the point where I was on my deathbed and I couldn't even lift my head up. I couldn't even open my eyes. They were like, we don't, we don't know what's wrong with that. The, your best bet is taking her back to the UK. She's gonna die here. When I got to the UK, when you're home and in your own safe place, you realize what's just happened to you for all that time. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I took an overdose and I wanted to kill myself because I thought, I'm not carrying a raped child. Got to the hospital, they had, they had to put me on the drip and then they kept me overnight. So when my family went, there was one nurse that came to me and actually made me feel like I was a human being. She came to me and she goes, you want an abortion, don't you? And I said, yeah. I went and had the um, ultrasound at 8.20 in the morning and I saw my daughter's heart beating and I said, no, I can't do this. I'm not taking this life out of me. It was given to me, no matter where and how it was given to me, this is a life that's inside me. I went back home to my mom's house, but things, I thought things would be different because I'm back in the UK and they weren't. They were worse. There was still that floating bubble of shame. This family still brought shame to the whole extended hierarchy of families, relatives. It really mind blew me because I'm like, okay, we've done everything that this ex that uncles and aunties and blah, blah, blah have told us to do. And we're still being looked down on. So. I put all my positivity, the, what I had left, into my baby, into watching my stomach grow. And I was getting quite concerned because whenever like there was loud shudders or the door was slammed or anything, my baby wouldn't move. They said, right, okay, we're gonna give you a set a date for a cesarean. She just looked like an ill baby, a very, very ill baby. And that's what she was. She was stuck in special care unit for three months and I couldn't bond with her. There was like 10 doctors that came run into my bed and they were saying things like, do you remember anyone being sick around you at that time? And I was like, yeah, the so-called husband was sick. And then in Bangladesh, when I found out I was pregnant, I told them I was violently sick and I was on my deathbed. They said, oh, um, your husband passed on a virus to you at the time of conceiving the baby. They said, your baby's handicapped. That's the term that they used back then. Your baby's handicapped. We don't know to what extent your child is going to be disabled. Yeah, it was hard. I was 16 and it was hard. It was so hard. I was disattaching myself from everybody. I was getting angry with everyone because I thought I blamed everybody. And I was like, you didn't just ruin my life, you ruined my daughter's life. My younger brother got a part-time job in a restaurant and I sparked up a relationship with one of the workers because I thought oh he's got a different accent he's not from Wales he's from England so I was like right here's my ticket out and I I think in a way I used him as well to get out also going on at the same time was plans for the so-called husband to come over to this country and what I did then, when my daughter came home to me, I actually ran away from home. Little did I realize that I ran away with a perpetrator who ended up in domestic violence. For five years, I had a son from him as well. And it was so bad. He, cause I came to England and I didn't know anybody. I was actually, he was actually married. I didn't know. And, I was beaten daily. He was a drug addict. 
my family were extremely angry at me because I was now a married woman running off with a married man. My family actually tracked me down, brought me back to Wales, and they said, right, if you want a, if you want a quick divorce, we'll take you back to Bangladesh, and you can get a quick divorce, and then you can marry this whoever person that you want to be. And I was going, hell no, no, I'm not doing that. Because I knew then if I go back, that's it, that's the end of my life. They'll keep me there. I picked up my daughter with one bag of clothes and that's when I left to come to England without any money, nothing. My family disowned me then for a good five years, the time that I was with this perpetrator. When I finally got the courage to leave him after five years, he stalked me. He um, threatened me, he would bump into me in the middle of the road, he'd call my house. I told the court what he did, like, he would actually threaten my children, saying that I'm going to kill the kids if you don't be quiet. And I was very messed up, very messed up. But I can happily say I never turned to drugs, never turned to alcohol. I was a very, I actually turned into a very religious person. I then obviously got out of that relationship. I started to get into more dysfunctional relationships in my 20s. And I thought to myself, why does this circle keep happening? I need to break out of it. You know, I've got young two kids now, toddlers. I remember on Facebook when I finally started connecting with my past, with my friends and everything on Facebook, there was a girl who actually committed suicide. She And she had a forced marriage and her story was like a mirror to me and I was shocked and I was like you know what I want to do something now I want to start speaking out now and I actually went through the newspaper article found a charity that commented on it and I asked them if I can come along and be a part of it and I was accepted and that's when I started to find my voice so I started traveling when I was 27 at that point I was I made up with my family with my mom and I put myself through education I wanted to be a counselor and then I turned my direction to mentoring coaching and then becoming an ambassador and then coming an another ambassador for two charities here in the UK I had to wipe all that conditioning that I ever had endured all that pain all that trauma wipe it all off my body and my soul and go within and create the ruby that should have been from the age of eight and that's what i did my daughter's 23 now she's she's profoundly deaf she can't speak but she is like a rainbow she is so happy it's unbelievable so happy all the time she taught me what unconditional love is and patience and my son, he was my rock throughout that domestic violence relationship. He was my rock. Everyone's probably asking, did he come over to this country? He did. He came over in 2015, 16 with a work permit. He actually had the audacity to ask my family for my hand in marriage again. I said, no. <laughs> he only saw his daughter once and I wasn't there. And he didn't want to see her again because she's got special needs. I guarantee you there's a lot of people around the globe that have been in the situation or still are or going to be in that situation. Go and seek help, seriously. It could be just a little thought that goes across your head because you might might have been conditioned to, know, to think that it's okay. My family are doing this for me, like I did, and I jumped up on a plane. But abuse is abuse at the end of the day. If it's against your will, don't do it. I'm sure there's many um, charities in America where you can reach out to or in the UK or in Asia. Quick Google search and they will help you. Seriously, it's your life at the end of the day. Love comes from within. You are worthy. You are beautiful. You have the strength in you. It's in your soul. Your soul is endless. You know, your soul is something that never ends just think how strong that is you know if you need to get support go and seek it out i never once thought that i would be living freely and happily and so content yes i have my bad days 
I'm always going to have those days, but it's learning to love those days as well because we are only human. Thank you all for listening to my story and you can reach out to me with the links below that will be added to this interview.